Hello, Learning Nerds, and welcome on in to the nerdiest podcast you're going to hear today. I'm your host. My name is Dr. Luke Hobson. I am a senior instructional designer and program manager, an instructor, and an author. And my passion, as you can probably guess, is instructional design. I love being able to talk about it, to share about it, and to teach more about instructional design. And of course, to be able to help you along your own instructional design journey. And whether you're a newbie and you just heard about instructional design, or you have been doing this for years, all are welcome on in to the show. And of course, you can find more about my resources that I have out there with the blog, the podcast, the YouTube channel, courses, and everything else to help you along your own journey over at drlukehobson.com. Quick announcement before we begin today's episode, wanted to let all of you know that Enrollment for Instructional Design Institute is officially open back up and the next cohort is going to be starting on August 28th. Now, if you don't know what Instructional Design Institute or shortened, we call it as IDI is, is that this is our seven week long instructional design boot camp to help you to learn more about instructional design, really from everything from A to Z with starting first of talking about andragogy, how adults learn to being able to go through all the different types of steps and motions. And then finally, at the end of the seven weeks, you are actually going to have your own learning experience that you can use, that you can put as a part of a portfolio piece and all that good stuff. Now, what sets IDI apart from others is that there is a lot of hands-on experience going into everything for this seven-week-long boot camp. Plenty of activities, assessments, practice questions, reflections, discussions, peer-reviewed-based activities, building out your own course, um, being involved with different forms of community events and workshops and webinars. There's a lot going on inside of there. Not so much that you get overwhelmed, but I want to be able to make sure you get as much experience as possible to help you, whether you are an aspiring instructional designer or you are a current instructional designer, because we do have a fair bit of both folks who enroll inside of the program. Now, my spin on instructional design is that I've been working in higher education for a number of years. So IDI very much does have an educational type of focus. So those who are currently enrolled inside of the program are working at a number of different types of institutions and universities around the world, as well as for K through 12 schools. And as as well as too is with a bunch of uh, government agencies. So really, it can be for anybody, for those who are aspiring to those who are currently inside of the instructional design world, and to try to be able to help to do that different type of professional development training in a unique way that makes instructional design fun, interesting, meaningful and relevant for what it is that you do. So once again, enrollment now is opened up, you can go down below and apply today. If everything does sound like a good fit, of course, you will be hearing from me to talk about next steps with you. And and of course, can't wait to see you inside of the course. Now, all right, well, let's talk about today's show because I have two of my close instructional design friends coming on to help us with answering your questions. Both William Crenier and Dr. Heidi Kirby are going to be joining us to dive on into a number of very interesting questions that you folks pose to us. These All of these questions come from you over from YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Compile everything and then start to go in and piece by piece and dive in. This is actually a continuation from William's last appearance where we did a Q&A episode and we received so many questions from you. Thank you, by the way. Super awesome material to be able to work with one another and brainstorm on these different types of uh, topics. So this is the continuation. We brought in Dr. Heidi Kirby because she does have a bit more of a specialization inside of corporate learning. That's William and I do not have. So we absolutely valued her perspective and hearing more about her answers to help us with some some very tricky questions. So today you will be hearing about questions such as, should I be listing out learning objectives for my students, which is an interesting one to be able to talk about, thinking more along the lines of AI and how instructional design, once again, where does this world meet, which I feel like we're going to be talking about all the time. And so we, we really get a uh, grasp on where AI is really going and it changes constantly to also talking to about the different types of titles that we have within the instructional design world. And what are the differences? Instructional design, learning experience design, learning scientists, learning engineers, whatever differences, where are we going? What does all these different types of things actually do mean? To talking more about, do you need web development skills, coding, HTML, et cetera? Is that actually going to help you out? To also then talking to about where is instructional design going as far as for branching off into the future with different types of positions and sectors, and also thinking about promotions. How do organizations right now currently hire for senior level leaders? Are they promoting from within? 
or are they trying to be able to get folks from outside and they want that outside perspective? And those are the people they are really seeking. We dive on into that more inside of this episode. So I won't waste any more of your time. Here are my friends, William Crenier and Dr. Heidi Kirby. Folks, welcome on in to another Nerdtastic podcast episode. And today's episode is going to be special because I have two friends of mine within Instructional Design Land who are going to help out with answering your questions. So allow me to introduce my co host for the day. The first is that he is the instructional designer and program manager over at EduFlow. He is the face of the widely popular EduFlow Academy. And I feel like on a daily basis, he sends me a new resource to learn about AI. He is my brother from another mother, the one and only William Crenier. William, welcome back onto the show. Thank you so much, Luke. It's uh, again, such a pleasure to be invited onto your show. Number three? Number four? Yes. Number three? three? Okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. You're regular now. So We're you know what? Now. I'm going to, I need to get creative with your introductions the more you keep on coming to the show. But also, cannot forget our other fantastic guest. She is the host of the Fantastic Block podcast and the co founder of Useful Stuff, a newsletter that dives in deep into everything LD. She not only teaches about podcasting at the University of Florida, but she also teaches about scenario based learning in her own course over at EduFlow Academy. My sister from another Mista, the one and only Dr. Heidi Kirby. Heidi, welcome on back to the show. Thanks. It's my third episode too. I was going to say, you've also been here quite a bit. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> yep. And this is the first time that all three of us are in the same virtual yeah. room, which we realized earlier. And um, that's pretty cool. Even though Makes we've been working together for like two years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it absolutely makes no sense. And Heidi, your episode, episodes, plural, because we did that kind of a series thing of breaking down the differences yeah. and similarities of higher ed versus uh, corporate America. That is still some of the most downloaded episodes I have. Oh, I believe by it. far. We're up to I episode. I still send it to people who are like, I don't know which to choose. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. It's just like, here's this whole conversation about that. And I think we're up to like episode 75 of the podcast. And, you yeah. know, that just really shows about this, how much your expertise and everything you were able to go through with us and talk more about with that was just fantastic. So once again, so thrilled that you're both now here to, to answer these questions because I felt like I definitely needed some help with looking over with these questions where some of them I'm like, hmm, that's kind of outside my wheelhouse. Let me bring on some experts to try to be able to help us with these things. And I have to give a massive shout out to uh, Dr. Rex Holiday because he was the one who really spearheaded many of these questions and sent them on over to us when we were asking about the Q&A for LinkedIn. So once again, a huge shout out. Thank you, Rex, for all of these fantastic questions. Uh, Heidi, William, are you ready to dive on yeah, into to the series? Let's do it. Okay, here we go. Question number one it says, I have this question about learning objectives. I am not a big fan of starting any course with the phrase, by the end of this course, you will be able to, but as someone new to the field, I kept my thoughts to myself and followed the rules. However, today I came across an article that seconded my thoughts. So my question is, what are the best ways to list learning objectives at the course and unit levels in a way that learners can effectively connect with them and understand what they will learn to integrate them as part of a learning process. William, going to toss the ball over to you. What do sure. you think about this? Well, I, I, I think all of us probably read that article. It's probably, I'm, I'm guessing it's that one by Christy Tucker that, that she published recently. Hmm. And um, my favorite part of the article was the comments on LinkedIn when she posted it on LinkedIn. And I was very surprised by how divisive it seemed to be. Like I, I, hundred percent agree with Christie's thesis, you know, like the, the fact that, um, learning objectives shouldn't, you know, that we shouldn't be like giving these formulas to learners, um, which are meant for us to, you know, we use them for planning, um, and reading that and reading all the comments immediately made me think about the fact that at, uh, and I think this theme will probably come up a lot. But in instructional design, we don't even know what to call ourselves, let alone what we should call the things that we interact with every day, unfortunately, right? So um, when I say learning objective, it might mean something different to me than it might 
mean to someone in higher ed or in corporate or in different niches within higher ed and corporate. So um, you'll get like learning objectives, you get learning outcomes, you get module outcomes, you get unit objectives, you get instructional objectives according to the MEGA framework, then you get instructional objectives according to the Will Tollheimer framework, then you get instructional design objectives according to the Will Tollheimer framework. It's just like, it's like saturated with different perspectives and we don't really have like a, a common way of talking about it. And so I can see why people get very almost like passionate because they might have this idea in their head of what a learning objective is. And one person might think, well, learning objective is just a friendly way of communicating to the learner what they're about to learn about, right? Um, but for an instructional designer, they might think that, uh, uh, they might think of an instructional design objective, which is that thing that's written, you know, by the end of this course, a learner will be able, you know, like the, um, um, uh, you know, we, we think about all the, you know, conditions and criteria and, you know, how, specifically about how you're going to evaluate all of the learning experiences or the performances that that learners do um so my my kind of strong opinion about this is that if you there are two and this is this is where we'll talk Tal talks about it so he, he has two big classifications of learning objectives you get learning objectives that are written and meant to be read by instructional designers and then you get learning objectives that are meant to be read by learners the ones that instructional designers use are they for planning they are the, the ones that contain the conditions and criteria. You know, it's like by the end of this course, learners will be able to do X to some extent um, under these circumstances. Usually that's how the formula works. You don't need to communicate it to that detail to your learners. Um, firstly, because it's jarring, you know, like you, you remove them from this immersive learning experience. And then secondly, um, it's it's not it's not user friendly. It doesn't contextualize the material. So what I would say is take a learning objective, take the instructional design objective, that formula we've written, and think about how you can communicate that in a human friendly version. Um, how can you uh, melt or, or like mix it in with the learning experience? So if you're going to instead of saying like listing the learning objective at the beginning of a of a paragraph or something, put it into like work it into your introduction or work it into your conclusion. Um, uh, 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 Tolana has like three different ways that you can do it in his, in his framework, which is very, very interesting and very useful. So um, it, it, we also used to talk about signposting, you know, so you said like um, in the previous um, uh, exercise, we did X. Now let's um, think about how we can use X to do the next thing. And this will prepare you for this final assignment that we'll do in this way. It's just, it makes more sense. We're, you know, like having a formula out there, um, it, it, it's just, no one's really gonna read it and really gonna take that in. Um, yeah, that's my little essay. It's a well-written essay, William, because I <laughs> agree with all your points to the, the things you said. I've also dove in deep into Will's work too, and I'll definitely put some links in the show notes to, to highlight some of Will's work because it, it is very interesting to see about this and to also think about how it, it takes like special kinds of instructional designers for us to be able to like to debate at this micro level to be able to say like it should be called this it should be this we should be doing da -da 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 -da. and it's just like yeah but like also like i get it I, I i get it but also for the common you know type of thing we're trying to be able to work on here do we really need to go this deep like there's a time and a place to go super deep within the academic literature there's also a time and a place where you're just trying to be able to you know teach a new instructional designer about how to create learning objectives I'm not going to throw at them, you know, a 200 page book and say, here you go. I was like, no, the, the one thing that I did take away from Will's work that I started to do within my own courses, because I am in higher ed. So like, according to accreditation guidelines and whatnot, like they have to be there. If I'm listening, like the learning object, learning objectives, learning outcomes do have to be there. But one of the things that I started to do was that I did mention about like what the learning objective was. And then a paragraph below it, I basically was like trying to translate the academic jargon to then say like, this is what it really means. This is how it's going to help you. This is how you're going to learn about stuff. So it's trying to be able to take the complexities that I must do, but then also think more about the learners and make sure that it actually does make sense and it has a flow and that it's not just lost upon them. Because when you do just list them all out, it's it's going to get lost in translation. So that's kind of my two cents. Heidi, what do you think? 
I agree with both of you. I did a presentation for, I think it was the second Road to L&D that was a predominantly educator audience for uh, TLDC. And I basically took Blooms, which like most educators are really, really familiar with for writing learning objectives, and came up with a way to combine it with Mager's performance objectives and to create like really great learning objectives for the instructional designer. And then I kind of showed a way to combine all of those into like one sentence that can work as like a course description and like kind of combines all the learning objectives in a really nice summary that you can use for your end learners instead of having to list everything all out. Cause I think you're right. Like Will mentioned um, that it was jarring and I think it does kind of like break that fourth wall, right? When you come in and you're like, today you're going to learn da 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 da. And like there, there's no way that we can prove that that's what you're going to take away. Like that is the goal, right? And mm. so I think it's more, the learning objectives are more for us on the instructional designer side to make sure that we're staying within the parameters and within scope and that we're not letting our, our poor SMEs get into the weeds, which they love to do. So makes sense. Makes sense. And, uh, Heidi, I think you've got a really nice LinkedIn article about if I remember so I took the LinkedIn article down and turned oh, it no. into the presentation uh, okay. instead because right. it needed some updating. But yeah, mm. so it's it's now in the presentation. Yeah, I can send you the link, Luke, and you can put it in the show notes. Yeah, I say to send me whatever both of you. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw everything <laughs> in the show notes. Uh, awesome. But you ready to move on to the next one? Let's do it. Okay. This one says, we are now fully immersed in an AI generative world, but AI hasn't quite replicated human voice and mannerisms yet, though this might be moot in five years. Myers suggests, and I agree, that we don't learn particularly well from robotic characteristics. Just curious to hear the thoughts of two brilliant designers, now three, on the influx of AI generated learning products. So Heidi, I'll, I'll toss this one to you. What do you think about this? I just did a post about this recently. I have yet to see in the ed tech space, I've seen some good like deep fakes, right? But if we're talking specifically the ed tech space, I have yet to see a AI generated voice or video avatar that doesn't evoke uncanny valley response for me. And I explained a little bit what Uncanny Valley is in my LinkedIn post that it's the um, I think it's literally described as like the feeling of disgust, disgust and repulsion that you get when you see something that's trying to be human, but isn't quite. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm sure if you're like me, you've played with like the AI art generators or like the profile picture generators and like the things that they do to humans, hands and eyes, <laughs> like the eyes are really like. I think that's one of the things that makes us most human, right? And like, it's just not there yet, right? Mm -hmm. Like, none of it is there yet. Like, you can tell it's not a real human. And then we have also this um, this problem where people are like using Chat GPT. Chat, oh my gosh, Chat GPT, like it's Google. And, but like Google at least tells you the resources like the references where it got the information so i think what we're seeing right now is like a really good try <laughs> but we're just like not quite there yet and i don't think it's mm. going to replace um amazing voiceover actors um i don't think it's going to replace we all have like a really high def camera in our hands all day every day um it's so easy to take video for learning ourselves you know i don't think I don't think we're there yet. And I think to this person's point, like um, we have to be really careful about the multimedia principles when we do start using them. Yeah. I do wonder about, and I saw two thoughts because you mentioned about Heidi, like the deep fakes and whatnot. If you think of anywhere else outside of ed tech, you have these incredibly scary, realistic examples. And I'm like, is it just a matter of time until like we get into here? Like that's that's my assumption. I mean, like when um, MIT before they did a deep fake about the moon landing and Nixon, and that was years ago. Looked legit to me. Um, this is before we we're talking about AI in this manner. Uh, but I was also listening because I, I saw this kind of like revolt come from all of these fans of Lincoln Park because it was a deep fake as far as for using Chester Bennington, RIP, his voice and singing a Slipknot song. And 
it was him quote unquote sounded just like him and mm. it was like whoa i bet now there's always kurt cobain cover songs of oh, like he's man. singing rem and all these other different things or, like black hole sun and you're like yeah. oh this is getting weird so it's it's so it's get it's there but it's not in our space yet which really does make me kind of wonder about kind of like where this is going how it's being you you know all these things of that nature but also the writer strike is currently happening right now with everything so this has been um hitting everything as far as for movies and netflix and, and all these talk show hosts and whatnot netflix specifically this article just came out talking about how some of the wording in their contracts is saying that the voice actors are giving permission to actually have AI generated voicing of like their actual like their their IP, if you will, of your own voice, what makes you unique and giving that to Netflix is a part of the contract. And for voice actors specifically, like that's terrifying. So it's I don't know about I don't know how I feel about this one. I like AI in a number of places, but this to me is this like, whoo, it's good. No, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, I, I think so Uncanny Valley definitely is a, a big barrier. And maybe that's something that's keeping our job safe for a while. But I think there are going to be interesting ways to get around it. And I think at the moment we, we uh, and I, I keep going on about this in, in terms of AI, in terms of we shouldn't immediately try to replace our processes and practices and way to do things. I think we can find ways to augment. So uh, an example of how AI is helping us to augment is there's this incredible audio enhancing tool that Adobe came out with. We can take a really, really bad sound recording and you can upload it there and it, it, it pushes out a like studio quality sound file that you can then just bring into your project and it'll it, it, it gets rid of all the weird background noises it fixes all the audio it's incredible so i think maybe in in this like intermediary phase between um you know ai just releasing and us getting over this uncanny valley will be augmenting ourselves so it'll be ai tools that uh, enhance the quality of our video um, or our audio or um, it'll help us to get rid of especially for me all the ums and ahs that that you put into your speech so soon these ways of augmenting will make our processes much faster and cheaper um, so that'll be really good i also think that um, in terms of like video and or of uh, and uh, yeah, like an AI avatar and an AI sound together is very difficult. But I have been playing around with some really good um, artificial voice, um, AI voice generating tools, and they are incredibly good. They're still obviously not perfect, but they're very good if you are on a shoestring budget and you can't afford a voiceover artist and you want to do a scenario and you want this like um morgan freeman sounding narrator to come in and say something really epic and then you can um just put like slides or something to set the scene or whatever you don't have to do a uh, like a, a virtual avatar and virtual sound together um you can disassociate them or if you've got a virtual avatar make it obvious that it's a robot um don't dress them up like real people make it like this is a fake you know, th what if clippy spoke you know th that wouldn't be as jarring as someone who tries to look like a real person. Yeah. I'm going to throw my laptop across the room if Clippy spoke back to the day to me. I would have freaked <laughs> out. That's how I would have. Like, wow, no, no, no. Now, okay, but back then, that would have terrified me as a kid. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, let's move on to our next one because this one is, is interesting, and I, I feel like it could also be a whole episode um in and of itself too but this one says in your opinion what exactly is learning engineering and how is it different from instructional design and learning experience design so i'll, I'll take a stab at this if, if the both of you don't mind um because when as soon as i hear more about learning engineering i interviewed dr aaron kessler from mit on the show back in like episode 15 like way back in the day because i I too had this exact same question of what the heck is this? And it feels like now this keeps on growing to be kind of like instructional design versus learning design, instructional design versus learning engineering. And there always seems to be this confusion every year or so about exactly what do we do? Who are we? What are our titles? And 
so on and so forth. Learning engineering is a little bit different, and I say a little bit using those words specifically. So by pulling from um, the actual definition of learning engineering, it's that it's a process and a practice that applies learning sciences, uses human-centered and engineered design methodologies, and iterative data-informed decision-making. So it's essentially thinking about learning as an engineer, which some could argue could be similar or some could argue could be different from what is it that we do with an instructional design. But there was a really good article from Dr. Jim Goodell, who really is like one of the main uh, thought leaders within the learning engineering space. And uh, the blog was, are you doing learning engineering or instructional design? And this was interesting. And I pulled this quote actually from this article. And it says, part of the learning engineering process is discovering the root cause of problems that impact learners and their development development. Sometimes those root causes are about things other than the learning experience. Problems to be solved with learning engineering may have to do with conditions outside of the design learning experiences, such as a learner's basic needs or mindset. So that was like, okay, all right, I'm starting to see about how potentially this could be different because unfortunately, once again, when we say the terms instructional design or learning experience design, I mean, let's be very clear is that your organization sets who you are and what is it that you do. Because of that, there's no industry standard amongst these things. We can write about this, we can talk about this, but an instructional designer at MIT could do completely different things from an instructional designer at Apple or from a local organization or for whatever, which makes everything super duper confusing. So learning engineering at least seems to have its kind of own niche of being more focused on an engineering side of the house, which I can appreciate. At least there's some clarity to me about that. But then once we start having the debate about is it instructional design, is learning experience design, then that's when this kind of blows up and which I did blow up the other day on LinkedIn too um, about that. So <laughs> that was another fun way yeah. to read the comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a, yeah. That was another one. And it's like, and I, I get it. I, I understand why some people strongly feel but they actually should be called learning experience designers or strongly feel that they should be called instructional designers but it all it all really depends like there's no clear answer in my opinion it's, it's super duper depends upon so many variables mm. yeah i have a i have a hypothesis about why we have so many different titles so okay. like like what you mentioned there just reminds me of like instructional systems design you know sure like there's sure. A, like there's so many different <laughs> terms and so many different overlapping um uh, yeah uh, like interests and stuff like I'm, I'm pretty sure an instructional designer will will tell you that we do exactly what you just described that a, a learning engineer does and what what this makes me think of is um I, i'm guessing you both probably read that book uh, not that book that edu cause article about emergency remote teaching mm, um yeah where they so they started this whole thing about like um i, I can't remember exactly how it went but they, they essentially created this term called emergency remote teaching to define teaching or to define like, um, let's say learning design or instructional design that is bad. And that was like just cobbled together from, mm -hmm. you know, like taking live lessons so that we can quickly bring them online for um, like uh, the pandemic so that everyone can learn online. But those weren't really well, not weren't always very well thought out learning experiences because they, they, they weren't designed from the perspective of you know from the ground up they were designed from the perspective of this worked in real life and in, in in like in person and now let's just dump it all there and make everyone go through powerpoint slides and like this google drive folder of everything so that's emergency remote teaching we are not that we are not as people who design learning experiences we are not emergency remote teachers we are something else and i think Maybe like the reason why we keep coming up with new ways of defining ourselves is because we don't want to be associated with the people who do what we are supposed mm. to do badly, <laughs> you know. So like uh, maybe uh, people who call themselves instructional designers have been designing terrible learning experiences. And here I'm thinking of like every single compliance course I've ever had to do, unfortunately. Um, like uh, people might think, well, that's what instructional designers do. I don't want to do that. I want to be something else. I want to call myself a learning experience designer. But I still think that it all falls under the umbrella of the same thing. I think whatever you don't call, you know, like whatever doesn't, doesn't fall under your definition of what you do is probably just bad, bad practices for what you do. 
right? So it'll be like, this is instructional design, unless it's done poorly, then it's not instructional design, then it's just wasting people's time. Um, yeah, that's my little hot take on there. <laughs> I like it. I totally agree. So Matt Smith always brings up something called Sturgeon's Law. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah. It's um, from the science fiction field, and it basically says that 90% of everything is crap, right? And so, like, if we operate under that assumption, like, 90% of the learning experiences that we all put out are crap, and I think people see that and I think they see they've taken a bad compliance course. They've taken a crappy e-learning. And so now they're like, I don't want to be an instructional designer because this is the boring stuff that they make. And so then they create these other titles and these other fields and these other. But the problem is one person on the Internet saying that something is so does not make it so. Right. <laughs> like one person on the Internet saying learning experience designers use purple crayons only and instructional <laughs> designers don't you know and it's especially when the people who are saying like who are trying to distance themselves from instructional design or instructional systems design which is what it was originally called right um as we like move away and try to come up with new names i think all it does is really uh it just they misunderstand it right because the people who are like, I'm fine with the title instructional design are saying, no, we do needs analysis. No, we also use purple crayons. Like if we're good learning experience designers, if we're good learning engineers, if we're good instructional designers, we're probably all doing the same thing. Let's be real. Exactly. Exactly. Hashtag mm -hmm. team purple crayon. Uh, <laughs> but, like, but that was always one thing that I, I see people get caught up with is that they see the exact definition of instructional design, which has been around for a long time, but actually does like basically says about how you are designing instructional materials is like the loose definition of instructional design. And now in 2023, it's just like, whoa, whoa we do way more. It's not just that, like we do so much more. And I was, I was talking with some students the other day about when you think about the learning experience, I don't just think about the learning product. I think about yeah. surrounding that with the support, mm. the care, the feedback, the webinars, the workshops, the, the pre-assessment forums, the follow-ups, the, the group. Act. Like, it's like, it's everything. It's not just one part. It's the teaching, it's the learning and it's the design. So it's not just the, only the design. Like everything else has to be incorporated into that, which seems to make this massive debate on social media of people trying to be like, ah, because I, I know that when I do read, I'm personally, when I read from some people about how they either don't conduct research, like Heidi, what you're saying, like they don't do any research. They don't do focus groups or pilot programs. They don't apply the evaluations from other findings. They're just like, meh, it's done pff, and moving on. And I'm like, no, wait, no, <laughs> yeah. you did like the first part. <laughs> there's, there's more to it. And th that is this like, but that's not enough so hence when i mean internally i have this debate of like you know i've had it before of like what am i exactly nowadays because i can read things online and i'm like mm -mm, i don't do that or like well, i do way more than that kind of a thing so it's it's interesting i don't think we're gonna have a answer within the next 30 minutes here but you know, no. yeah. we can Once put again. some links in the show notes I'll throw more links. Primer. There's, there's, there's and there's a million things you can find online. <laughs> Dr. Ray Pastor did one talking about it. I know that Devlin's done stuff about it. There's a million resources if you go on Google or YouTube or whatnot. I'll, I'll link a few things. But overall, I think from like, uh, you know, speaking from all of instructional design land, is that there really isn't like conclusive evidence to really have this type of strong um, feeling about this. But you know that that is what it is. Uh, moving on, though, what what next question? Let's keep on rocking and rolling here. Uh, and this one says, do you believe that instructional designers should have web development skills like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? Why or why not? I personally don't have strong feelings about this, but Heidi, do you have strong feelings about this? I do. No, 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 no. <laughs> we are not web developers. No, no, a hundred percent. No, listen. If you want to learn HTML or CSS or JavaScript, if the reason that you're learning it is simply to manipulate Storyline, I would encourage you to find a different tool other than Storyline. There are so many tools out there. Um, I hope you don't mind on me bagging on Storyline on your show. They can come after me if they want. I've but... bagged on them plenty. Go, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> they're, they're... 
you know, SCORM is outdated. Like, we talk about AI and adopting AI. We're still using SCORM. What do you yeah, mean we're going to adopt all this AI point. stuff? Like, we're still using technology from the early 2000s. Um, it's allowing LMSs to monopolize. Like, anyway, that's a whole... I, I could go on about this for hours. However, if you're learning JavaScript to manipulate storyline, I would encourage you to find a more um, efficient program to use for creating your learning because it's going to be probably a less uh, steep learning curve to learn like the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite, for instance, which is going to allow you to make graphics and um, infographics, animations, videos, like you can make anything with Adobe Creative Cloud. And if you're, but if you're learning, like if you want to learn HTML or CSS to theme your LMS or something, then yeah, sure, go for it. If you want to be a web developer and instructional designer, uh, you should probably make like 300 grand a year if you're going to do two roles in one. Um, so more power to you, like if that's why you want to learn. But I think a basic understanding of coding language and understanding APIs and integrations is a way more valuable skill in instructional design. Mm -hmm. Because if you can figure out how to get different programs and websites and software to talk to each other, you can create so like an impactful learning environment, not just a learning course. I'll step off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> William, have you used HTML that much in your own? Line no, of like I, I 100% agree with Heidi's. So I, I did a lot of HTML and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript and some PHP when I did like interactive media in my past life, but it's it's very useful for like like understanding the way the internet works and how your system integrates with other systems and like learning coding has been a very like nice way for me to like build almost like a mental model on how to look at systems and, and stuff like that but i I'm, I'm like very sure that i could have done pretty much everything I've done as an instructional designer with minimal coding experience. Um, if you, I really like what Heidi mentioned now about um, like just doing a basics of how computers and systems work, especially if you're going into like the LMS administration side, or if you have to like work with a lot of systems. And um, I'm just looking up here, Khan Academy has some really good like starter courses. So they've got like ones on like how the internet works or whatever just go on there do that quick course or just do a quick like watch a quick video james may uh, made a really good one uh, about how the internet nice. works um which is brilliant it just tells you like you know from when you hit in like type in a url to when you actually get the web page that's how it works if you know that then i don't think you necessarily need to know anymore no, I've I've used it far and few between. And usually it was actually back in the day when Blackboard was just a hunk of junk and things would break and I had to go into the code and fix it. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's really what I used it for the most, honestly. And now our systems and everything is so much more sophisticated and easier to use. It's it's not that much. I really need to mm -hmm. do that nowadays. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Heidi, I would give you more time to express your, your thoughts and feelings about this, but uh, I think you did a great job in capturing. <laughs> No, I, I like that. I like that. Uh, all right. Our next question here says, if you had to make a prediction, do you see instructional designers replacing the traditional learning and development roles in corporate training that are mostly human resource roles today? Uh, Heidi, I keep on throwing the ball back at you, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not in corporate. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I think that a lot of the traditional learning and development roles in corporate training that are housed under HR are uh, instructional designers or people that have that background, like even um, organizational development specialists. I'm trying to think of some of those different LMS admins, um, you know, uh, learning and development specialists who are just kind of doing like the orchestrating of everything. Uh, even facilitators, right? If we look at all those different roles that are generally associated with your kind of like traditional corporate L&D under HR, um, I think a lot of them just end up having instructional designer backgrounds. I don't think there's necessarily a replacement that's going to happen. I think that 
a lot of companies, when budget gets tight, will cut those roles. I know this happened to me um, when I was working somewhere a few years ago. There were two instructional designers and an organizational development specialist on my team when I started. And um, the org dev person and the ID left. So then I just accumulated all of the responsibilities of everyone. And so that included like helping with performance management and some of those organizational, more organizational development geared things. Um, I would say that as an instructional designer, having a little bit of knowledge of those different areas is helpful because you may end up with them on your plate like I did. Or it's just good to know because it's an easier and more efficient way to like serve the business to understand some of those organizational development things. But by and large, replacing, I don't know if I like the word replacing. I don't, I don't, I'm not buying it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the thing that I keep on also getting stuck on is the word replace. I'm like, no, I don't think it's replacing. Yeah. And I know a lot of the folks too, who, as you mentioned, like they do have a background in ID and they do have some formal training They do have something. Uh, they may not call themselves IDs, but definitely it's, you know, I don't know. So but this one's kind of a tricky one. It, but I think you did a great job of answering it, though, because mm -hmm. I was just like, I don't know how to tackle this. I was like, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's the right kind of a thing. So, yeah. W William, any thoughts to add, though? Uh, no, I, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had this this like perspective, but I, I did like whatever Heidi says, I support. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm with, and this one, I'm totally with you. I'm like, yeah, Heidi sounded great. I'm, I'll, we'll go with that answer. Uh, and the next question is, is us the probably one we're honestly going to go with Heidi's answer to. Uh, and this says, do you see a trend towards more corporations promoting senior instructional designers to the role of chief learning officer? Or will that continue to be a human resource role? I can't really. Uh, no, that was my nose. I can't speak to this, <laughs> which is just like, that's why, Heidi, I'd love to hear more about this because I've seen this happen in higher ed, um, which is not a. It's not going to be more like that chief learning officer role, but I have personally seen instructional designers start as an ID, become a senior ID, become director of ID, and eventually like AVP, vice president of ID within higher ed. So that does give me hope that it's not just the few people I know of, it's, it's been others. But uh, what have you seen, though, in your perspectives from this happening? Um, I haven't seen it done quite like nearly enough for me to be satisfied by it because my whole entire dissertation research was on the leadership skills that IDs need to run projects. And the whole reason that I did my dissertation research on that was because I was seeing not enough IDs being promoted into leadership roles, despite having all of these leadership responsibilities when they're leading individual projects, right? Like they have to collaborate with people all over the business at all levels of the organization instructional designers have to get vp and c-suite level stakeholders to do what they want them to do which is usually like give feedback or review or give give buy-in for a project right and like so they're technically managing these c-suite people and the C-suite people have no reason, have no repercussions if they just ignore you, right? So it's it's almost harder to manage up like that mm. during instructional design projects than it is to have your own team. And I've had both, so I can tell you it it is, it's more of, you know, your team, at least there's some fear there. We're like, oh, if we don't do this, we might lose our job. The C-suite couldn't care less. So you have to really hone your leadership skills to get people to do what you need them to do for you. And that in and of itself is a huge, huge, you know, transferable skill that I think we're missing. I see so many L&D leaders come from other areas we're in this weird space where like everyone thinks they can do training because everyone has an opinion about learning and education because they've done it right they've learned but they haven't necessarily taught so i think that there's like some misconception and so i see a lot of people from like this person asked hr or even sales or they've been a facilitator or they come from a uh, product or something right mm. and they've like oh well i've led all these big teams, but they don't understand learning and they can't really help. And so then the senior IDs end up having to manage up anyway, 
Like, why not just promote those people? So if I have anything to say about it, the trend will trend towards that. <laughs> and I keep pushing for that. And I keep encouraging people like these you have gold mines on your team just because they've never had the title before. And I've run into this myself where, well, you've never had that title before. Well, you've never led a team before. Well, you've never, you know, you've never been a director level. So we're not going to give you director level. All you're going to do if, you know, if the, if HR teams and people keep, teams keep doing this and they keep bringing people in from the outside, all you're going to do is just push these people to start their own agencies and companies. And now they're going to be your competitors. So, mm. Yeah, it sounds like you need someone who's very open minded um, on, you know, this decision making level yeah. to because I, I like I, um, I, th I think it's almost like a structural problem because ID teams are relatively small, you don't get opportunities to practice people management. So yeah. like it, 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 you kind of need someone to take a leap of faith and trust that this ID uh, you know, it, it is like going to do a good job at, you know, but that maybe is also about like how you, you present yourself, like how you put together your resume and, and, sh you know, yeah. when you apply for that management position, can you show that you have led maybe in a non-traditional way? Like yeah. uh, what's that lead influencing without authority or whatever? Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, the, the thing that I keep on thinking about too, with all of this is that, because I haven't counted this, because I once again I work in higher education, is that I have seen people who have somehow risen above the rankings who then will strongly have like one type of area versus another for a background, and I'd much more rather have a blend of somebody. So to give you an example, there is oftentimes this conundrum within higher education of let's say that somebody has always been a tried and true traditional academic, and now they've found themselves leading this entire team, but they have no leadership experience. They're always in the classroom, and then now all of a sudden they're leading everybody, or they have zero business experience. They've, they've never done anything as far as for being able to raise capital or do anything in entrepreneurship or like anything of a sort. And all of a sudden now they're the ones who are supposed to be directing what products we should do, what strategy we should be utilizing and how we should be going together as an organization moving forwards. And they have no business acumen. And it's like, can we have a bit of both? Where, where that way, you know about learning, you know about people, but also you also know too about like where you should be taking the organization because the more you keep on moving up within your organization, you are the one that people are going to be going to as far as for saying, what direction should we be going in? What is the market currently saying? What exactly based around this data should we be going forward with this? And if you can't answer those questions, then problems. Major problems. And also, and Heidi, as you mentioned, you have to, no matter where you are, you, you have to be able to then influence those, once again, in higher ed, that if you are going to be influencing for deans or for uh, presidents or for uh, AVPs or whoever it is, that's, that's got to come into play. And hopefully, you know how to do that. Because uh, if not, then it's, it's a real, real uphill climb. Yeah. Cool. Easy enough. Well, I, hey, we did it within the, uh, the hour, folks. Like that yeah. was the goal. Can we do this in an hour? We did. Uh, <laughs> so I'm proud of us. I think we did a great job. I mean, I'm, I'm biased and I have the two, two friends here who can answer these questions better than I can. So I'm thankful that both of you were coming on to the show so early this morning as well, too, uh, for everything. Uh, where can people go to learn more about you, find you, connect with you? Heidi, I'll start with you first. Where can people find you? Yeah, if you go to www.heidikirby.com, it's basically in my link tree. So it has everything I do and you can follow follow along there, including my dissertation if you're interested in reading that long thing. <laughs> Which is a very, very cool read. I, I Especially you. if you ask these questions about like how, you know, I, I, uh, Heidi's dissertation is a, a real treasure if you oh, are looking thanks. for something interesting. William, is my dissertation a treasure? Um, I haven't see, I've read no, your book. No, I've you read haven't book. read it. You haven't uh, read the dissertation. Send me a link. I will definitely try to read it. <laughs> you don't, please don't. They, thank you for the self-promotional plug of my book. Appreciate that. You don't, no one needs to read my dissertation. Unless if you want to, but you Great. don't need to. <laughs> uh, William, where can people find more about you and what I you do? My LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me. So um, just go to LinkedIn and search William Cronier, C-R-O-N-J-E. Um, and that's where you'll find me. 
Awesome, awesome. And folks, once again, at home, if you like this format of William, Heidi, and I answering your questions, please feel free. Let us know. Leave feedback for us in the comments section on YouTube when you share it and tag us on LinkedIn, anything like that. And of course, as always, you can send us questions. Please feel free. You can direct them over to me at LinkedIn or Luke at DrLukeHobson.com. Email us your questions. More than happy to once again collect them, figure this out, bring on some awesome people, and answer the questions for you. But William, Heidi, once again, thank you both so much for being here today. Today. really appreciate you thanks this Luke. was a blast it was so much fun once again Heidi William thank you for coming on the show sharing your perspectives because some of these questions were really tricky but of course really fun to be able to answer once again a big shout out to Dr. Rex Holiday for giving us these questions and for us trying to be able to really think about them it, they fired us up when we were trying to be able to plan out answering these questions we were going back and forth and having some hot takes so it was a lot of fun so if you have a question you want to be able to submit over to the show you can always Always go down below and leave a comment wherever you are listening to this episode. But you can also message me Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, email, send over your questions. I will keep on compiling these, creating Q&A, different types of episodes, and then inviting on instructional design friends and experts to help us with unpacking them, sharing their words of wisdom, and keep on going from there. And as a reminder, if you want to nerd out with me and a fellow group of learning nerds, be sure to apply for Instructional Design Institute, our seven-week-long Instructional Design Bootcamp. We are currently inside of week four, and it's a blast. It's been so much fun to connect with other people, share stories, talk about experiences, leave feedback, give guidance along the way to help people. Uh, this is so much fun. I absolutely love being able to do this. And of course, to connect with all of you. So be sure to apply today. And of course, you'll be hearing from me afterwards. And as always, if you enjoyed the show, go down below and leave it a five-star rating wherever you are listening, Spotify, Apple, podcast, YouTube, Stitcher, whatever. <laughs> leave a review, leave a comment for the show. I read all of your reviews. It's so awesome to hear about what you think of the show. And as long as you keep on listening to the show, I will keep on making more episodes to help you along your own instructional design journey. Hey folks, that's all I have for you today. Stay nerdy out there. Talk to you next time.